For the last eight years, I have worked as a professional storyteller. On stage and screen, I've taken scripts given to me by other individuals, interpreted their words, and delivered performances of those interpretations. Today, however, I would like to tell you my story, the self-written, self-lived script of my journey into the performing arts. Now, I could tell you that I became a storyteller after one rainy day whilst on my way home from netball. I was suddenly struck by a deep spiritual calling to bring joy to this world through the medium of entertainment. But I'm about 96% sure that my passion for storytelling really came out of a desperate need to get more attention than my little sisters. I learned the hard way that baby fat stops being cute after age seven, and so I had to find new means of getting by. My first big break came at age 10, when I won the role of the Pied Piper in my primary school's production of The Pied Piper. This is the classic moment where I would share a picture of myself in the role, but my costume had more colors than I believe should be legal for a human being to wear, let alone one who was only 10 years old. So I've decided to spare you all today. You're welcome. But as great as this achievement was, it bore absolutely zero weight the next year when I auditioned for my first production of high school, which was the musical Grease, and I was kicked out of the very first dance round. I was mortified. I ran home crying, and when I explained the situation to my mum, she told me I should never embarrass our family by crying in public over something like that again. Tough love though it was, it paid off. I taught myself to dance, and I came back the next year for the school's production of Annie, and I got the part of Annie. And then year after year, as I did each high school musical, I also started going to watch professional theater and doing workshops with the cast members from the shows. And that's when the thought entered my mind. If people could actually do this for a living, then this was what I wanted to do. I left my UCAS application blank, and went to a musical theatre college in London for three of some of the most challenging, yet rewarding, years of my life. And after appearing in two short musicals and an even shorter stint pulling pints and dropping plates in a nearby pub, I made it through eight rounds of auditions and got my first West End job in a musical called Mamma Mia. I'd realized my dream, and I was ready for the best year of my life. Life, however, had other plans. A few months in, I landed badly from a jump in the show and injured my knee. I took a week off, but when I got back, the pain only got worse. And then it got embarrassing. I would come into work and be fine for the warm-up, only for my knee to give way as I walked up the stairs to my dressing room, meaning I'd then have to be sent back home. A knee consultant recommended that I get a steroid injection. I would feel mild discomfort for one to two days, but be ready to go after that. I woke up the day after the injection, and I'd never felt such excruciating pain running down the bottom half of my leg. I'd had a reaction to the steroid and spent the next two weeks, including Christmas Day, on crutches. I'd also now taken so many days off that I wasn't being paid if I didn't perform. I'd worked so, so hard to get to the stage where I was on the stage, and now my own body was failing me. I couldn't understand why. After my contract ended, my consultant said I would have to stop performing for nine months in order for the now bruised bone and scar tissue around my knee to heal. So I got a role as a temporary receptionist, and I traded the stage for the boardrooms I now got to stock with sandwiches for business VIPs. I learned to use a lot of fancy and expensive coffee machines. I nearly broke a lot of fancy and expensive coffee machines. And even though all the people I met on these jobs were friendly and kind, and their atmospheres had structure, routine, and really nice leftover sandwiches, <laughs> I knew deep down that I wouldn't. I couldn't stop performing. No matter what my body was telling me, I had only just begun. Still. I'd use my time for something. Now, I'd never found English very interesting at school, no offense to any teachers here, but I thought perhaps that my passion for telling stories might not be limited purely to performing. 
So I started using those seemingly endless hours sat behind a computer screen to write about the things that I was experiencing. My pains, my hopes, my ambitions. And I began to really appreciate the time I got to spend doing something creative that my focus on performing hadn't previously allowed for. The pain subsided, my knee healed, and I returned to musical theatre, but this time with a confidence and skill in writing, which has served me both as an actor and in the work I now create myself. In the time between that first jolt of pain and my recovery, I had to really ask myself whether storytelling was for me, whether I was even cut out to tell stories. And even though my knee did eventually heal, I asked myself that question again a year later, when I fainted in the middle of a singing audition from overexhaustion. And again, when I jumped backwards off a table in a dance rehearsal, expecting two castmates to catch me and landing on my back against the floor. And again, when I lost a year-long West End contract three weeks before rehearsals were supposed to start. But ultimately, the answer never changed. And staying true to that answer has, in time, allowed me to work around the world, across musical theatre, stage, television, and this year, film. And it's brought me here today, sharing the journey to some of those experiences with you. That, in a very compressed nutshell, is my story. Now, here's the thing. I could have told a different version of that tale, one where I didn't spend Christmas Day on crutches or earn minimum wage in a burger pub, a version where I took out every moment that made me look weak, embarrassing, or just, like, not very cool. And it wouldn't have been untrue, but it would have been unreal. But that unreality wouldn't be dissimilar to the way that many of us are presenting our lives today. We have a round-the-clock chance to show the world who we are, where we are, and how we're performing. And with that has come the pressure to make each of our experiences worth other people's time. And they're double taps. Maybe a comment, if we're lucky. Maybe a comment with actual words rather than emojis, if we're really lucky. We need to look brighter, shinier, and better at captions than the rest of our peers. And we're evaluating our choices based on that external feedback. Hmm, maybe I shouldn't have ordered the leek soup because that picture only got 16 likes, whereas my avocado toast from two weeks ago got 43 likes. We're living in a culture of mass curation, and we're diluting our stories as a result. And with the help of technology, retouch, conceal, airbrush, tools created to make us look our best, so we're believed to always be doing our best and feeling our best and hashtag blessed, and anything less, remove from album, permanently delete. But in trying to present these flawless versions of our lives with no challenges whatsoever, we are detaching ourselves from some of its most important moments. How would you make a 90-minute action movie if the main character opens the door to begin their search for the treasure chest, and there it is on their front doorstep, gift-wrapped? When we see people facing challenges and rising above their fears and limitations, we learn through them that we can too. We all relate to their experience. Now, there's a lot of literature already out there telling us to reframe the way that we think about our negative experiences and our failures. But I think that the word failure still comes with a negative stigma that makes it difficult to approach with a neutral mindset. So this is what I suggest. Rather than embracing failure, I think we could erase failure altogether. How do we do that? Well, if failure is defined as a lack of success, then we need to start changing the way that we look at success in each of our experiences and try to adapt its definition every time. About two and a half years ago, I hung up the phone after another call from my agent saying that I hadn't gotten any of the four jobs I'd auditioned for in the last week. Being now in the seventh month of these sorts of calls, I was really just 
scraping the bottom of the barrel of my positive mental attitude bank account. I sat in a slump opposite my mum, and she leaned in, looked at me and said, Abiola, it will only take one job. I leaned in, looked at her and said, Mum, I would love that job to come before my next credit card bill. <laughs> she gave me a hug and told me to just keep going and that that in itself was a win. Seven months. I had been doing this for seven months. It was starting to make me ill. How was I supposed to keep going? And then something clicked. Somehow, I had been doing these auditions for seven months. So, what was another week more? If I could make my mind start taking this week by week, day by day, just call by call, perhaps I could manage a little bit more sustainably. Less than a month later, I got a leading part in my very first TV series, and over the next two years, filmed 16 episodes of a sky drama called Jamestown. That's me, on my last day on set, filming season one, doing something that 10-year-old me could have only dreamed of. A lot of people say that I actually look 10 years old in this photo, so <laughs> it's interesting the way the world goes around. <laughs> But for all of the likes and comments and emojis that a photo like this might have received, the success part of the story isn't this picture. The reason that this picture even exists is because of a change in my way of thinking, to one where I just took each audition as it came, and I chose to see each one as a training experience in a boxing ring, preparing me for the moment when I would be ready and strong enough to seize this opportunity. In this story, success meant persistence. Success meant patience. Success meant listening to my mom, of course. Throughout my career, I've been fortunate enough to have learned from some truly incredible actors, writers, directors, and other creative professionals. But it's been in those moments of loss, injury, and despair where I've learned the most about myself and what I'm capable of fighting through. As the author of your narrative, you have the chance to fill it with all of the range, richness, and roller coaster plot twists that have made and shaped some of the best love stories of our time. You can turn an injury into a new skill, or decide that a period of uncertainty is really a corridor of limitless possibility. So as many of you prepare for new and uncharted journeys in education and in life, I invite you to take a firm hold of every experience thrown your way. Discover the value and the lesson it has for you, and trust that each of those lessons can and will serve you on whatever path the story of your life takes you on. The pen and the power are yours. Thank you very much.